so we have a, a, a sign. Uh, we got a number coming up um, on, the, on the screen. Those of you that are the closest to God this morning, the most spiritually astute, um, wise, bright, whatever it is, you're going to know what this number is. John, good? Do you want to? Yeah, exactly. See? <laughs> you, can, you can see the glow from over here. Um, friends from... Uh, Cross Current Legacy, um, uh, if you don't know, this is one of the things we'll keep track of from here on out. Uh, 29 days till Pitchers and Catchers report four of the most beautiful words in the English language. Um, so yeah, 29 days. But what 29 means too is that I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that. Uh, this isn't just football season as much as I was glad the Jaguars won. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're waiting for baseball to begin. Um, we're waiting. As Perry mentioned last week, we are waiting in a variety of different ways and times and seasons and situations in your life. Some of the waiting is for more the mundane, as I admit, for the baseball season to begin. Some of you are waiting for far more significant things. We're in seasons of waiting right now. And as Perry Sight mentioned last week in his um, excellent, important, biblical, practical message, uh, he asked a very important question. What is our posture while we wait? What's our posture? What's your posture? What's my posture as we're in this waiting process? Are we fretting or are we resting? And that's an important question to keep in mind. I think God wants us to think about this morning. As we're in this waiting season, whatever that is in your life, are you fretting or resting? It's important. It's timely. Because when we're in waiting, it can do a number on us. It can do a number on our view of God. It can do a number on our emotions. It can do a number on our relationships. Waiting is not easy, especially if it's a very difficult waiting room that we're in. So it's timely and important, not only because it's the beginning of 2023. It's timely and important. It could be July, and it would be timely and important. So the next three weeks, we're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to focus on Jesus and how he can help us rest in our waiting. We're going to focus next week on how Jesus can help us reflect. And then in three weeks, we're going to focus on Jesus and how he can help us realign, rest, reflect, and realign. These were three seasons of a couple of sabbaticals that Cindy and I have been able to take, and it has been very important to us, the ongoing impact of this trilogy, this rhythm of rest, reflect, and realign is still paying important dividends, but we're going to look to Jesus for this, so that this rest and reflect and realign isn't just a, a static once-off kind of thing, it is a, it's dynamic, it's an unforced rhythm in our life that we rest and we reflect and we realign as we live and breathe it becomes normal for us. So why? What, where is this coming from in my life? It's come, you'll hear where it's coming from in the Word, in the Bible, the Word of God in just a moment. But, but you need to know from a, a question I had in some chaplaincy training from my mentor, my chaplaincy training, he would ask us, Jeff, where is this coming from in your life? And this is coming from both my sleep and my stomach. <laughs> because fretting shows up in my sleep and in my stomach. When I'm fretting, I don't sleep well. Cindy will tell you, I, I turn and I toss. And she can tell if I've had a restful or a fretful night of sleep. It also shows up in my stomach. I don't like what happens in the pit of my stomach. The anxiety as I fret as I worry, as I get anxious, and I'm not past any of that. I also don't like, this shows up in, I have Cindy in quotes, meaning our most important relationships. Fretting shows up in our most important relationships. When I'm fretting, I will have a tendency to be shorter with Cindy. I will have a tendency to be more impatient with Anna. And I don't want that, and I don't like that. I don't like the impact of fretting I don't like the impact of fretting in my relationship with Jesus because fretting detracts 
It draws energy from my ability to, to keep Jesus and central and focus in my thinking where he needs to be and where I want him to be. Fretting deludes that. So I want a fresh reminder to rest and reflect and realign from Jesus because I want to sleep better. <laughs> I don't want this knot in my stomach all the time. I want to know rest from Jesus. And I want it to show up in my relationship with Cindy and all the other important relationships in my life. But most importantly, I want it to show up in my sense of Jesus being present and speaking and close and hearing him on a regular basis. I want that. Because as that happens in my life and in our lives together, we will be compelled to share Jesus. If Jesus isn't showing up in our lives in some of the most fundamentally important parts of our lives, why would we ever commend him to anyone else? if he's not showing up in our lives. So I want us to grow together, like I need to grow together with you and Jesus helping us rest and knowing that he is doing that. So where do we go? Jesus, obviously, but, but I'm gonna be borrowing uh, significantly today a couple different times from a book entitled Gently and Lowly. And uh, been very impactful in just a short time. I've been reading that. But the author of that book says this, but in only one place, perhaps the most wonderful words ever uttered by human lips, do we hear Jesus himself open up to us his very own heart. And that's the passage we're going to look at this morning. Jesus himself opens up his heart to us, to you and me, in a way that is very unique. It's Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. The context of this verse is important. In the, in the seasons of Jesus' ministry, when he was here on the earth for, for his human time, he knew opposition was coming. This is a season in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus knows that opposition is going to grow. It's just beginning. And so he in his sovereignty and his love and his goodness says, you need to know this, my friends, his followers, his disciples, because it's going to get hard. And as we wait, we don't know what the seasons of waiting are going to be for us coming in the future. But I'm guessing God has a timeliness to our being exposed to Jesus and how, how, helping us rest as we look into the future with who knows what may be coming. Jesus knew opposition was coming. It's the only reference of these verses in the whole of the Gospels. It's only in the Gospel of Matthew. So let's read this. But let's ask God to, to speak to us through his spirit in a very particular way as we read these words of Jesus. He says to you, he says to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will Perry said last week, some memories are coming up. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So who's invited? Who is this invitation being extended to? Jesus says it's to the weary, the people that are living exhausted those who are living under the pressure of, quote unquote, the law, living under the pressure of trying to perform in order to gain God's goodness and grace and forgiveness. You see, because that's what happens apart from Jesus. Apart from knowing that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has paid for our sin, has put us in a new standing with God. We are justified in his eyes forever based on 
the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you're not living with that reality as the people around Jesus in that day were not, then it is wearisome. It is a burden to go through life never knowing if you're right before God. Never knowing if, if all the good that you're trying to do is ever going to measure up. Jesus relieves us from all of that by a simple trust in his death and resurrection. We are placed in a brand new state never to be reversed. We are justified in his eyes never to be changed from that and it has nothing to do with your performance or my performance. It has everything to do with the grace of God Period. No additions. You and I can't change our standing before God one iota from our performance, our obedience. But if we don't live with that fresh reality in our lives, it is tiresome, it is burdensome. And the people in Jesus' day were living under the law and they had no confidence that the, their obedience would ever measure up and there wasn't a settledness in their soul because there isn't apart from Jesus. So Jesus is speaking to them. Those of you who are living under the law, trying to perform in order to, by your obedience, gain an acceptance with God, it's tiresome, it's wearisome. And I have come and I am speaking to you. I'm speaking to you who are burdened, who are weighed down by this performance expectation. So I have a longer quote this morning from this book, and, and I'm reading it because as I read through this, who this passage is for, I was intrigued with how many of the phrases came to mind, from one from my own life, how he nailed so many things in my life. But I thought of you, and I thought it's going to be worth reading this because this might just be a connection with you and God, in the sense that if this human author has nailed something in your heart and you go, yes, that's me, how much more does God get you and what you're wrestling with and why you're tired and why you're weary, why you're burdened? So this message, this passage, this word is written for the discouraged, the frustrated, the weary, the disenchanted, the cynical, the empty, those running on fumes, those whose Christian lives feel like constantly running up a descending escalator, those of us who find ourselves thinking, how could I mess up that bad again? It is for that increasing suspicion that God's patience with us is wearing thin. For those of us who know God loves us but suspect we have deeply disappointed him, who have told others of the love of Christ yet wonder if, as for us, he harbors mild resentment, who wonder if we have shipwrecked our lives beyond what can be repaired, who are convinced we've permanently diminished our usefulness to the Lord, who have been swept off our feet by perplexing pain and are wondering how can we keep living under such numbing darkness? Who look at our lives and know how to interpret the data only by concluding that God is fundamentally parsimonious. I paused there for a reason. I had no idea what that word meant when I first read it. I had to look it up. I've spent the last day trying to figure out how to say that. Thanks for Karis' help. And I actually went online. Parsimonious. Anybody want to give a stab at what that means? I, I didn't. You're in good company, by the way. It means frugal to the point of being stingy. That God is stingy, frugal with his grace, and he's not. This is for normal Christians, by the way. This is for you and me. Sinners and suffers. It's the subtitle of the, that wonderful book. He really sees you. He really knows you. He really does. So does he mean, what does this, when Jesus says, come to me, what does that look like? What does it look like for Jesus to say to you and to me, come to me? It's an invitation. First and foremost, it's not an invitation to a class. 
He doesn't say, go to a class and figure out what it means to come to me. He doesn't say, go listen to a podcast about what it means to come to me. Jesus means it when he says, come to me. Come to me. This is a personal invitation to you and to me to fundamentally say yes to Jesus and forever change your status before God by that simple act of trust in Jesus. If you've never done that, especially if you're on Facebook Live, no, excuse me, YouTube, you're, it's good to see you. And if you haven't said yes, welcome to our time together. But this, this is something of a very personal invitation to us to say yes to Jesus, not only once that forever changes our status with him, but to say yes to him every single day. It's an intimate time. It's a sense that Jesus gets you. That you have a sense, you have a knowledge in the core of your being that out of the eight billion people on this planet, Jesus sees you. And if you happen to be under 18, I am specially speaking to you right now. If you are young and you are under 18, please do not think you have to wait for this. You have to wait some number of years before you, you can wake up every morning knowing that the God of the universe gets your heart, gets your anxiety, gets what's troubling you. If you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, this is for you. I was a youth pastor for 13 years. I love high school, middle school students. In some sense, planting Christ Community Church, and my mind was plan B. Because he asked me to move away from student ministry. So students, you're on my heart. I don't want you to think for a second you have to wait a day longer before you can wake up every morning with a sense of Jesus being aware of you, speaking to you, have an intimate, personal sense of Jesus in your life. But this takes attention. It doesn't come about by happenstance. It takes attention, and it requires his words. His words in the Bible, the words of Jesus, but the words of the whole Bible are spirit and life, and they're Jesus. I get excited when I hear about followers of Jesus getting a lot out of worship music, getting a lot of, out of good books, getting a lot out of talking with others. I thoroughly am encouraged by that. But every single one of those are, none of them are a replacement for the words of Jesus. And I encourage you, no matter what your learning style is, how you go about engaging with God, whatever that is, it's unique to you and I affirm that. But at the same time, it's got to involve the words of Jesus. It's got to involve, it has to involve the word of God. So however you work at that, figure it out. How to get the word of God in your life, the words of Jesus. I think in some respects, there's got to be an element of quietness. I am not speaking about everybody has to sit at the desk with a, with a candle and, and quiet. I know that that is the farthest way from some of you connecting with God. So I don't know how quiet looks with you in your life, but there's got to be a sense of space where you actually listen. It's quiet enough. The noise is not as loud as it has been in your life, and you can listen to Jesus. So it's personal. It's intimate. There's focused attention. It's his words. It's quiet. Somehow we listen, and it's also with others. It is a personal invitation, but it's an invitation to community as well, to figure out what Jesus is saying and walk with him in community with friends that can help us also hear Jesus. It's no mistake that Jesus taught us to pray for daily bread. Daily not once a week, not every other day, daily 
bread. Some of you, I don't know, you may not be like me and Cindy and others in our, our household, but carbs and bread are right up there with word of God and bread. <laughs> uh, especially if it's sweet bread. You know what it's like when you're hungry and you eat that piece of bread or whatever it is. And, and there's a physicality to that joy. There's a physicality to eating that bread that Jesus wants us to know in his conversation with us. That our times with Jesus can be like that. As physically satisfying as bread or whatever your go-to is for that. And Jesus can be that intimate, that joyful of a connection. His words can be that. I so long for you to have that daily experience. That you wake up, <clears throat> because I want to wake up every morning, not every other morning, not three times out of the week or four every morning with a sense of Jesus speaking to me about my day, speaking to me about my heart, my relationship with Cindy, Karis, Anna, you. I hear Jesus. And, and this isn't too mystical, by the way. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, there's this beautiful dynamic of the Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit. That's as strong and foundational and theological as the Apostle Paul. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. That's what I'm speaking about. That we wake up in the morning and we have this sense that the Spirit of God, Jesus, is bearing witness with our spirit. And students, by the way, let me just remind you, you're in my heart and you're in my eyesight. You're in Jesus' eyesight this morning. That you, will, you wake up every morning with a sense of Jesus. He sees you, he gets you, he loves you, and he's going to be with you, helping you every second of your day. And you know that your spirit bears witness with that. I needed that this morning. This is fresh out of the oven, so to speak. I get a text from one of my dearest friends outside of Cindy. I would venture to say my closest friend, Daryl Wright. You've heard about him from middle school days. We get together. I had lunch with him a week ago. Lives in Vienna. His youngest daughter was rushed to the ER by ambulance this morning with gallstone pain. And then I get a call on my phone not long after that, this morning, from Virginia Hospital Center. Still should be called Arlington Hospital in my mind, but it was a Virginia hospital. And I didn't recognize it. I picked it up, and it's my friend Mark Nation. Many of you have met Mark over the years. He's a special friend. He was a kid in a youth group. He's 50-some now, lives in Arlington, but he is in trouble with his lungs. He smoked his entire life. He almost felt like he was going to pass out. He rushed to the ER. A friend took him, and he's in Virginia Hospital Center now. He called me to let me know that this morning. He's got COPD. He's got emphysema. He's got some bacteria in his lungs now. All this is going on. Well, I'm kind of final preparing for this time. <laughs> and I hear the Lord, I hear Jesus saying, do you want to speak from experience, my friend, this morning? <laughs> I'll give you a couple opportunities. But I heard Jesus. I heard his spirit bear witness with my spirit. Trust me. Trust me. You can trust me with Claire. You can trust me with Mark. You can trust me with what's going to come out of your mouth this morning. Trust me. If you're a kid today and you wonder what this is like, uh, ask your parents. Ask your mom and dad. Ask them what it's like to wake up every day and have a sense of Jesus. And if they look a little befuddled and they have the honesty to say, good question, then walk through that together. Figure it out together. If you're a kid, I do, I give you this charge today. Ask your mom or dad. What's it like to wake up every morning with a sense of Jesus bearing witness with your spirit? that he's going to be with you. He sees you. Yeah, and, and if I were asked that question, I, we would have said, yeah, let's figure this out together. I don't have all the answers on this. But walk through it together as children and parents. Figure that out together. 
The promise is, I will give you rest. It's a promise. He will give us forgiveness and grace and freedom from performance. He will give you that. It's a promise. But the, the intriguing thing when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, take my yoke upon you, Jesus said that in the original language. It's, it's called, I have it here someplace, an imperative. It just went out of my head. Jesus is saying to you and to me, it's imperative, not optional, to take his yoke upon you. The yoke was that wooden frame that they put around ox. It was a symbol of, like, I'm with you, of subjection, of, of we're doing work together. It's, yeah, it was heavy. It was load. It was a load. But Jesus says, take my yoke, my wooden frame upon you. Learn from me. It's an imperative. It's not optional. And this is his very own heart when he says, I am gentle. This is the part where Jesus exposes his heart to you and to me. He says, I am gentle. It's the same word for meek in Matthew 5, 5 in the, in the Beatitudes. And he says, I am humble in heart. He is accessible. He is approachable. Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. That's the core of his being. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but his open arms. And that was in gentle and lowly. The posture most natural to Jesus is not a pointed finger, but it is open arms. So next week, we're going to just a little tidbit we're going we're gonna to reflect on some of this next week. We're not going to do a lot of reflection today. You can do it on your own if you'd like. Please do. But next week, we're going to reflect on that. We're going to reflect on to the degree, what does our life look like? Would we be called gentle and humble? Is our basic posture to those closest to us a pointed finger or open arms? We're going to ask Jesus to speak to us with grace and the truth, reflecting on some of this. But Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. Whatever else you think about Jesus and how he might be responding, yes, he is holy. Yes, there is judgment. Yes, there's a whole aspect of the wholeness of the character of Jesus. But fundamentally, he is gentle and humble in heart. His words, no one else's. So the promise is repeated, but then he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is parallelism. It's synonymous. Being easy and light are, are two different ways of saying basically the same thing, that his yoke is useful. His yoke is comfortable is another synonym for easy. Another interesting synonym for easy is kind. His yoke is kind, it's comfortable, it's useful. I loved reading one point that as a carpenter, Jesus would know, it could also mean literally well-fitted. And that would mean that these big, rough timbers that would form the yoke of an ox, good carpenters would know how to shape those big timbers to perfectly fit a particular ox. And they would take that wood and they would shape that yoke they would take rasps and other tools so that that big, clumsy, big piece of wood would fit well on that ox because that carpenter shaped it just to fit that ox. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, my yoke is well-fitted. In fact, somebody said if Jesus had a tagline to his, his uh, webpage, um, it, it could be, my yokes are well-fitted. So whatever he is asking you and me to walk through, he is not doing it capriciously or with lack of wisdom. He is doing it because his yoke is well fitted. And sometimes you can see the a yoke and it's double. It's a double yoke. It's not just single. And one of Cindy's favorite images is, is in her yoke. She, she looks over and, and there's Jesus right there <laughs> looking over at her in the double yoke, walking through life together. The Christian life boils down to two steps. 
The first step is go to Jesus. The second step is see step one. <laughs> it's really quite simple. And again, that you need to know that came from <laughs> gentle and lowly. <laughs> go to Jesus. Figure it out. No more excuses. No more blaming. Own it. Let's own this. Let's figure it out together in a fresh way. Let's pray. So the worship team comes up. Father, we just take a moment right now and, and pause and uh, ask you to take the words, your words, your living, abiding words, and please um, may they find good soil in our hearts. Good soil. Soils that are not preoccupied with the busyness of this day and this world, that are not deceived by the riches of our lives. A good soil. It takes responsibility that here's the truth. Father, thank you for this invitation. Jesus, thank you that you have invited us to this intimate, personal, fundamentally essential relationship to our lives, our well-being, and our eternity. Father, you know every single heart in this space. You know every single heart on YouTube. And I just trust you to take your words by the power of your spirit and shape it to the needs of our hearts, starting with mine. In the precious and the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Jesus is waiting, God so 